The human body has two kidneys, located in the retroperitoneal space, posteriorly just below the ribcage. Its primary job is to filter and excrete waste from the bloodstream. And one of the ways we can measure how effective it is, is by doing a GFR test, also known as the glomerular filtration rate. This is the rate at which the kidneys filter your blood. This is done at a rate of 125 milliliters per minute, which equates to about 180 liters per day. That's a lot of filtration by the kidneys. This is the single most useful test for kidney function. Ideally, our GFR should fall between 60 to 120. In normal age individuals, that should be between 90 to 120. But as you age, things start to decline a little bit. That's why we have a range of 60 to 120. However, your GFR is directly tied to kidney problems. And if your GFR significantly drops below 60, we can ideally understand that there's something going on with the kidneys and maybe some minor problem or it could be a more severe problem. Another useful test we can do is a BUN test, blood urea nitrogen test. As your filtration levels drop, as your GFR drops, the waste products are not filtered anymore and urea and nitrogen build up, so your BUN level tends to go up. So this tells us the problems that can be arising as your GFR drops. Now, in order to understand how all this works is you have to understand how the blood actually comes into the kidney before it gets into the nephron. Unfiltered blood comes in via the renal artery and divides into segmental arteries. Then it makes its way between the renal pyramids, called the interlobar artery, it makes a 90 degree turn and arcs around the base of the pyramid, called the arcuit artery. And then it extends out outwards at the cortex area and they radiate outwards, called the cortical radiate artery. It then it makes its way into the afferent artery and eventually into the glomerulus, where we are going to have most of our filtration happening. Now, before it leaves, it leaves via the efferent artery. It doesn't go right back into the venous system. It actually loops around. And this is known as the peritubular capillaries or the vasa recta. It loops around the nephron before it goes back into the venous system where it goes right back in reverse. The arcuate vein, interlobar vein, segmental vein and the renal vein and then into the inferior vena cava where it's taking his filtered blood back into the heart. Now in order to understand how everything is tied in with the GFR you have to know what a nephron is. The nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. This is where all the filtration is happening. So without the nephrons you really don't have a kidney that does anything. The nephron is made up of millions of nephrons in both kidneys. It is made up of a tuft of capillaries called the glomerulus, a Bowman space, a Bowman's capsule, and together this is called the renal corpuscle. Then we have the first part of your tubule called the proximal convoluted tubule loop of Henle, a descending limb, and an ascending limb, distal convoluted tubule, and then your collecting duct. And don't forget about the peritubular capillaries. As afferent vessels come in into the glomerulus, efferent vessels leave, but they don't go right back into the venous system, as I mentioned earlier. They loop around the nephron because it gives the body another chance to reabsorb and secrete particles along the tubules. Now steps of urine formation and filtration. The first step is the glomerular filtration that happens at the renal corpuscle level. This is the filtration of fluid from the glomerular capillaries into the renal tubules. And if we zoom in here at the renal corpuscle in the Bowman space, we see the glomerular membrane is made up of three layers. First, endothelium has what we call fenestrated pores. These are little holes that allow substances to pass through, smaller than the holes. A basement membrane 
and podocytes, cell that engulf the capillary endothelium, and they have what we call foot processes, and the combination of foot processes creates gaps between them called filtration slits. Now, if we look at this picture horizontally, here we have our capillary endothelium, a basement membrane, the blue, and our capsular space on this side. Now, the capillary endothelium, this is the lumen side. You can see the RBC here. You can see those uh, fenestrated pores, the holes. The holes are small. So any substance smaller than those holes ideally can go through that area and become the filtrate. Anything larger than the pores typically will be staying behind and stay in the bloodstream. And that includes RBCs, albumin, large ions such as plasma proteins, plasma aminoglobulins, and even hormones. Now the basement membrane along with the capsular side podocytes are lined with negative charges. And if you remember from chemistry class, negative charges repel negative charges. And one of those negatively charged proteins are albumin. So if somehow albumin sides and squeezes through these pores, there's another defense mechanism, these negative charges that's going to repel it and prevent it from leaving the body. We never want albumin to be lost in the body or lost through the urinary tract. And if albumin is squeezing through these pores and these fenestration slits right here, then we call that protein urea. Now, some of the substances that can pass through these pores, through the basement membrane, and these fenestrated slits. That includes water, electrolytes, glucose, urea, fatty acids, and uric acid, to name a few. Now, once that filtrate is formed, it makes its way into the first part of your nephron, the proximal tubule, loop of Henle, and then the distal tubule. This is where tubular reabsorption happens. As I mentioned earlier, these capillaries right here, they're kind of looping around the nephron. It gives the body an, another additional chance to reabsorb some of these contents. Sometimes the body may be like, hey, I'm dehydrated. I want to keep that water in my body instead of urinating it out. Or maybe there's some electrolyzed sodium or potassium, calcium, chloride that it wants to reabsorb, or glucose or amino acids or anything else. It has that ability to reabsorb all of these contents along the nephron. Now, same goes for the tubular secretion. If there's some contents that didn't drop off during the first part of your glomerular filtration, it can secrete some contents along the nephron at different stages. Once it makes its way into the last part of your collecting duct, the next step over here is the urinary system. Now there's one more key thing we need to talk about the glomerular filtration rate and that's the pressures that are exerted in the glomerulus right here. There are two things that you have to understand. One is the net filtration pressure which drives the filtration of the kidneys and the glomerular capillary filtration coefficient also known as the KF. The KF and NFP give way to your GFR, which if you remember our number from earlier in the lecture, 125 milliliters per minute is the GFR normal. And that is determined by our KF coefficient 12.5 and the net filtration pressure of 10. And I'll explain where 10 comes from here in a little bit. But KF is directly tied into the permeability and the surface area of the filtration barrier, the three barriers that I mentioned, the endothelium, the basement membrane, and the podocytes. Now imagine if that permeability in the surface area is affected by an infection, diabetes, hypertension, autoimmune disorders, all of those can affect those two components. And if things start to leak out, you know, your GFR is going to be affected uh, significantly. Could go up, could go down, depending on the cause. 
Now, the net filtration pressure is determined by three pressures. The first pressure is the glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure, which is the driving force and pressure of the blood. That's kind of directly tied, in, tied into by the blood pressure. So that is 55 millimeters per mercury. The second pressure you should know is the capsular hydrostatic pressure in the Bowman space. And that also has a hydrostatic pressure that is opposing the filtration. So this is going to oppose filtration, whereas the glomerular hydrostatic pressure is promoting filtration because we want things to come here and get pushed out so we can have filtration. Now there's a third pressure called the blood colloid osmotic pressure. This is actually from the caps, capillary side because that's directly tied in with albumin. Albumin is a molecule, a protein molecule, that attracts water. And anywhere it goes, and remember, we don't want to lose albumin in the filtrate. So albumin is in the bloodstream, and we want to keep it in the bloodstream. So if it's over here, it is going to attract water wherever it is, and it's staying in the bloodstream. So it's going to pull pressure towards it. So this is why it is opposing filtration, because of that albumin molecule. So when we put it all together, net filtration pressure, NFP, is the hydrostatic pressure on the capillary side, which is 55, minus the hydrostatic pressure on the capsule Bowman space side, which is 15, and the osmotic colloid pressure, which is from the albumin on the capillary side opposing pressure, which is 30. So 55 minus 15 minus 30, gives us a net filtration pressure of 10 millimeters per mercury. This is the driving force, meaning 10 millimeters of mercury pressure is driving this filtration outwards. So things are getting filtered. Imagine now if your hydrostatic pressure, your blood pressure dropped by 20, from 120 over 80 to say less 100 over 60. That could potentially make your net filtration pressure zero because that number would, let's say, become 45. And 45 minus these two guys, 45 would be zero. You would have no filtration going on in the kidney. That could be a big problem. Now, lucky for us that the afferent artery and the efferent artery has the ability to vasodilate and vasoconstrict to prevent any major pressure changes and filtration problems from happening. Imagine running this engine without any gasoline or any blood coming into it. It can fry the whole engine. Imagine running your car without gasoline. That would happen. But we do have some defense mechanisms in place. But imagine long-standing hypertension can cause damage to the permeability, can damage to the glomerulus here can affect the KF coefficient. Same thing goes with diabetes, long-standing problems with infections, kidney stones, autoimmune disorders, cancers. A lot of things can affect the GFR. This is why it's always important, you know, especially if you're having flank pain in the lower or actually in the upper back, that you want to go get your urinary test done and GFR possibly and look at also your BUN levels. It's a very important concept. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me.